I think the first thing that you gotta do with the Lycanius trilogy is forget what you heard because there's a lot to like here, but it's not perfect. Hey, what's up, bookworms and venerate Mike here today to talk a little Lycanius trilogy by James Islington and what makes them good and what makes them bad and all the things in between. I think there's been a lot of confusion on this channel about if I liked this series or not. I mean, you guys do realize that I had a really tight schedule last year and I said, you know what, I'm going to try to cram these three massive books in there before the end of the year because I didn't want them to interfere with my Malazan real long. Uh, here's the thing with this. Because I only reviewed book number one, people assume that I didn't like book two or three. Look, I have my criticisms of them, but I like it quite a bit. In fact, I recommend the series all the time. I recommend you pick it up right now. They're all available on trade paperback finally. Pick them up. It's very much worth a read. But uh, we're going to get into kind of what I think is really good and what I think maybe not so good. Uh, so I was called the good and the bad of the Lycanius trilogy because, uh, look, this is a first-time author. There are some problems with it. But again, I think this is a very, very ambitious debut. And we're going to kind of talk about Let's talk about the series a little bit first by itself. Released over the course of five years uh, in 2014, we had The Shadow of What Was Lost. 2017, we had an echo of things that come. And I love these covers, by the way. And then, of course, 2019, The Light of All That Falls. I always want to say fails. But again, I love these colors. They're just so simple, but just so striking. Uh, so, so nice. But uh, yeah, a huge story told over the course of like 2,000 pages on the trades. And uh, like I said, full disclosure, I really, really enjoyed the series. But like I said, it's not perfect. I don't think that anything is really perfect. But I think that there's, a, there's enough here that it justifies talking about, okay, this is more than just your standard review, what makes it good or bad. Because I feel like it's kind of equal footing uh, on the pluses and the minuses. But I do think that the pluses are much stronger. Does that make sense? That makes it, we're going to kind of talk about it here. But look, uh, I want to give a little spoiler warning here. It's not going to be full spoilers or anything like that. But if you want to go in completely blind, knowing absolutely nothing, I recommend you just watch the review I did for book number one right there. It's full, spoiler-free, and it'll give you an idea of what the series is about. And if I think that you would probably like it or not, you can probably guess off of what I say in that video. But there are a couple of machinations within this story that I'm going to have to discuss to talk about why I think that they are either good or or bad here. So uh, again, I don't think it's anything that's going to ruin the story for you. It's just I don't want you being like, oh, hey, I didn't know that they did this in the book and you ruined it in that video. Uh, I'm telling you up front. So if you skip this in the timestamps, that's on you. That's on you. <laughs> uh, like I said, so if you'd rather go in blind, just watch that, that mini review. But uh, I'm not going to spoil anything that's going to break the series for you. I like to focus on the good. So let's do the good first. I said I think this is a hugely ambitious tale for a first-time author. Author. Let's get a little fuel here. I think the world building is good, really, really good. It, it, it provides enough hooks. There's enough where you're interested in knowing what's going on in other places just than where our characters are. You want to know what happened here? What are these rules they keep talking about? Uh, why can they do this and why can they not do that? Why do they have uh, like a class system. These are things you want to know right off the bat, and he gives you enough answers slowly. He gives you enough in book one to make you interested in keeping going. Uh, the twists, man, the twists in this are so good. Like, really, really good. A lot of authors, I would say, okay, you're trying too hard. You're Brent Weeks in it. You're just having twists just for the sake of having twists now. Now, these feel earned because I definitely feel like he had an outline for this series before he began because the twists not only land, but they're really good. And they're the kind of, if you ever did a reread, you'd be like, I see what you're doing here. Uh, but again, I love all the world building of the many cultures and the societies and things like that. Lots of, lots of interesting tidbits to kind of get you interested and invested in that world. Doesn't throw too much at you at once to where you're just throwing up your hands. Like this is just too much for me to keep track of. But a very much in a kind of a wheel of time way where you keep knowing that there's a bigger world out there and you're getting enough of it a little bit at a time. And, and I think that's a really, it's really well paced. It really, it really is. Uh, but yeah, again, the twist in this, they left my jaw hanging more than once. I'm going to keep going back to that because I think the epilogue of book one might be one of the most shocking 
epilogues I've read in a fantasy source. It's 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 just just you'll see, man. You'll see. It's 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 worth it for that. If you're kind of feeling mixed about book one, you read the epilogue. I challenge you not to read book two. It's that good, and it just completely changes the book once you know what the epilogue tells you. So uh, again. Right away, you're getting some uh, some big answers that uh, you might need and you might uh, not know that you needed. I want to talk about the magic system for a little bit. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, I'm I'm mostly a soft magic guy these days. Uh, if it isn't Brandon Sanderson, I'm not too crazy about other authors' magic systems. I liked Lightbringer, what Brent Weeks did, but uh, Lightbringer just makes me get violent when I talk about it. So <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. So if you're needing a well-defined magic system. It's it's not really well explained here, I think, but I still put it under good because it's good enough that it provides uh, one of the bigger things in this, and that is, of course, time travel, which I'll talk about here in a second. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good magic system, but it's nothing that's going to wow you. You're not going to be studying it like you will Allomancy or something like that. Uh, let's talk about some characters here. I think the trio of Davian, Ashalia, and uh, Weir are really great together. Anytime uh, two thirds or all three of them are together, uh, usually the book is re- having a really—it's really hitting its stride. It's doing very well. Uh, I love anytime they're together. I love Davian and Weir. I really buy them as best friends, you know. And uh, uh, the romance, maybe not. That—that's always going to kind of depend on you if you want your romance in this kind of book or not. I think it's about on the level of a Brandon Sanderson. Uh, so if you've liked romance and like Mistborn or something like that, you might like this one. Uh, but yeah, it's very, uh, I don't want to say YA, but it's not far off. Uh, it really isn't. The series has a lot of violence and it has a lot of like beheadings and stuff. But again, uh, like a Stormlight Archive level. I, I'll talk about the Brandon Sanderson comparison a lot. Uh, I feel like it's the same kind of uh, rating scale where you would say it's it's not grim dark. It's, you know, it's, it's almost adult fantasy, but it's not quite YA. It's somewhere right in the middle there. Uh, not a lot of bad language, not a lot of gratuitous sex or anything like that. Uh, but there is violence. There's decapitations and things like that. So uh, I can't say it's PG, you know, but uh, PG-13 for sure. Uh, but Caden... Uh, Caden might be one of the most layered characters I've ever read in a fantasy series. Like, ever. This character, you think you know, oh, I've heard this story before. You haven't. Man, it takes so many twists and turns. And then when you think you know what it is, I can't say. I mean, the ending to this series, all-timer. It's an all-timer. There's lots of things I didn't care about in book three, which I'll talk about. But that ending was amazing and it made up for any problem I had in that book so I'm telling you guys right now the journey is worth it because the the payoffs in this series are hugely satisfying and it's one of those things like when you're reading it you're just going to feel so good right here and be like this feels like it was worth the journey of these massive books because they are long long books I also like Terrace. I think he's a spectacular supporting character to the point to where I almost wish it was more of him uh, I got a lot of uh Damage landman dragon around out of him. Uh, I think that a lot of uh, he's you know he's been there. He's done he's done some shit right, and you want to kind of him to be like the Obi Wan character. But he every time he starts to think you're, he's going to be a big part of the story, he kind of fades off into the background again. But I like the character a lot. Uh, I can't say it's bad except that just I wanted more of him. So uh, I guess that that would be I'm still putting that under good. I want to talk about the venerate here. The Venerate are fantastic. The Venerate are exactly what I wanted the Forsaken to be in the Wheel of Time. If you go back and you watch all my Wheel of Time videos, I kept saying I thought that the Forsaken were absolute clowns. They were like they were like slip on a banana peel level villain. They're supposed to be these amazing super powered characters, and they're just buffoons. They are just straight three stooges slapping each other. I never understood why Robert Jordan made that decision with Wheel of Time. With this, the Venerate are badasses. And they very much remind me of the Forsaken if the Forsaken weren't buffoons. That's kind of what I think here. So that's where I'm going to say, I think that it did that. It did the version of the Forsaken from Wheel of Time, but it did it better. Whereas I think Wheel of Time, Wheel of Time did the magic system better. So uh, when you see that comparison, I think that's where you're getting it from is because the Venerate are very much like the Forsaken, except intelligent. And the magic system, I could see it being very much similar to Wheel of Time or people thinking it's similar to Wheel of Time. To me, it feels more 
like a Sanderson. It feels like the, he's obviously I like he's obviously not as good of a writer as Brandon Sanderson. No shit. Uh, but he's a, a. I feel like this this universe and this magic system and this romance could all be something that takes place within the Cosmere. It feels like that, and that's a compliment. I really do feel like Sanderson fans and Will of Time fans are going to enjoy this, unless they're just you know basically being elitist jerks, which I'll talk about here in a second. But uh, yeah, again, guys, it's worth it. Overall, like I said, just to get to this ending. It's just superb. All right, let's talk about the bad stuff. I don't think that James Eilington is a bad writer at all. Again, like I always say, guys, I'm just a dude with Wi-Fi. I'm not here to critique uh, people's penmanship skills. Uh, it's going to distract a lot of prose purists. He does repeat a lot of words, repeat a lot of sentences. I mean, even I noticed that, and I don't look for things like that. But uh, yeah, uh, again, he's not as strong of a writer as some of these other epic fantasy authors that you're reading right now. Sure, sure. Again, first-time author, and to do something this ambitious on his first try, uh, I'm going to give him more credit for that than not. But yeah, if even I notice it and I don't look for things like that, I'm sure a lot of the the, the fantasy snobs are going to have a hard time with his prose because uh, it isn't exactly whimsical or anything like that. Uh, the structure, man. The structure of these can be really confusing. Uh, it jumps all over the place. Anytime you deal with time travel, that's going to happen. Uh, anytime the book's in italics, I was like, oh shit. Because it meant it was a flashback. And the thing about these flashbacks is he would never tell you when they take place. They are so out of sequence. And there are characters who just show up in these chapters like this with this POV character. And apparently this POV character has known this character for thousands of years. And I'm like, why is this the first time we're hearing about it then? I'm on, I'm on book three. Why is this the first time I'm hearing about this character? And it can be frustrating. So, I mean, you basically need to put together a flowchart or an Excel spreadsheet of just this timeline, trying to figure out how this timeline works together because you are not going to understand the first time when something is happening. Not what something is happening, when something is happening. And it can make it very confusing, especially when you're dealing with people who have had multiple lifetimes and they're dealing with different names and different personalities. It's It can get very, very convoluted. So uh, I think you should need to be expecting that. Uh, it's going to be jarring. And I mean, there was a couple times where I'm like, am I just a dummy or is this just written to be kind of disorienting? Because there's a lot of things I'm missing right now. Oh, I felt like once you finished it, you kind of understood it. And I feel like on a reread, you could probably put this in order. But on a first read, like I said, anytime you see it in italics, you're like, oh, no. You know, because you don't know when something is happening. Uh, you know that trio I said was together, Davian and, and Weir and, and Ashalia? Yeah, they're hardly ever together. That's a problem. They are hardly ever together. Ashalia is kind of doing her own thing most of the book. Uh, Weir has political responsibilities. And Davian is a man trapped in time a lot of the series so i feel like they when they do get the time together it makes it that much more special but it also makes it hard for me to believe a particular romance in that because i'm like you guys have spent like two pages together you know so uh that that might be kind of a struggle for you but uh again i, I wish that those characters would have spent more time together also aelric and desia 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 uh, I, I can't remember how i actually said it uh, it's not that I don't feel like they don't get a satisfying conclusion. It's I don't feel like they get a conclusion at all. They're important through two and a half books, and then they just kind of drop off the face of the earth. And uh, I was like, oh, okay, what happened? On uh, the Lycanius Reddit, some people have said that Eilington wants to write a novella about those two characters. And I, I, that'd be welcome, because I do feel like it just is a character. He just said, I don't know what to do with them, so I'm just going to kind of drop them out of the story. Uh, it feels like that kid on Married with Children, he went up the stairs and he never came back down. That's, that's how I feel about this, because I felt like it was heading somewhere, and then it just kind of dropped. And it's a thing where it just it felt like maybe that this needed a fourth book. Uh, I, I don't know. You, you could kind of feel weird about saying that, because you're like, look, these are three monster books. And if these were regular size, this would be a five-book series. I feel like I could have used another book, maybe two. I really do. Uh, I feel like he tried to tell a seven book series in three books. I really do. So if that's a, you might look at that and say, there's no filler. Oh no, no, there is. That's a problem. Book three, the first half, because you are meddling with timelines here, this is the problem I think he ran into. And again, this is just a guess, guys. I feel like he had nothing for Davian to do for the first half of book three that he had him doing absolutely nothing 
yet he made us spend so much time with him. It was the point where it was like, I feel like I'm reading Elaine chapters in Wheel of Time right now. Like, why am I reading this? You could just sum this up in a paragraph. So it had an event that ended up being important, but while you're reading it, you're going to be like, what did he do with Davian? I, I don't understand what the hell happened here. But the second half of book three for Davian is awesome. So again, it makes up for it, but just be ready for that. And it may seem like it's not important. It ends up being important. So it, it's kind of like that. So it'll feel like filler when it's happening. It may it end up being important, but it, it can kind of be sloggy to get through that first half of book three. So there you go. Time travel is always going to be tricky, but like I said, man, you need a goddamn flow chart. This timeline is just all over the place. It's overly complex at times. The characters are using a lot of terminology to where you're just throwing your hands up being like, what are they even talking about? What is it? It just feels like you're just making words up now. Thankfully, there is a glossary and you can refer to these words and things like that. But there is a lot. You're going to have to take notes if you don't use the glossary um, just to know what some of this terminology is. Because after the first couple of times, he assumes you've got it. He's just going to throw out several made up, made up words and you're just going to be like, I don't, I'm not sure what's going on right now. Uh, but yeah, I think my biggest, biggest criticism was this book right here, book three just had off pacing. I felt like the first two were tightly wound. Uh, I know a lot of people had problems with book one or two. It seems like everybody either loved one or the other, but book three, it's pretty unanimous that the first half of this is rough to get through, but the ending again makes up for it. So uh, I think if I got to get into why you should read it now, I, I like I said, I think this Brandon Sanderson and Wheel of Time fans are going to like that. I know they get mad. They get triggered about this quote in the front that says, love the Wheel of Time. This is about to become your favorite new series. And I've seen big time Wheel of, Tube, uh, Wheel of, Tube, Wheel of Time booktubers just shit on this series. Like they couldn't even get to, because I feel like they went into it with their arms crossed because nothing can be as great as Wheel of Time. I say, look, separate that. Just look at it in its own series and you'll realize there's lots of things there that you're going to like. And I know it, it upset a lot of fans when somebody... Uh, I think it was my guy, Petrick, who said that uh, Lycanius was Wheel of Time without the fluff. And I know that that upset a lot of people. It's not like Wheel of Time like that. It's kind of what I said about uh, The Faithful and the Fallen by John Gwynn. It's not like A Song of Ice and Fire, but I think A Song of Ice and Fire fans will love that series. I think Cosmere fans and, and um, Wheel of Time fans will enjoy this series if they just give it a try with an open mind. Just let it stand on its own. Don't try to compare it. Don't go to it being like, well, he's not as good of a writer as Brandon Sanderson. Duh. Oh, it's not as deep of character story as Wheel of Time. Yeah, it's three books, not 14. It's not going to be comparable in that way. But I do think that you'll find plenty that you like here. The magic system, like I said, not as good as Wheel of Time, but the venerate, awesome, awesome version of The Forsaken. Just put your biases aside, and I think you're going to have a great time with this. I absolutely recommend this series. I don't know why people thought this, because I didn't... Look, I'm not going to review each book and series, guys. If it's something that I feel like it needs it, like I'm doing with Malazan right now, because I'm doing it as a read-along, sure, I'm going to do that. I'm not going to do three non-spoiler reviews for a series, because I'm just going to repeat the same things over and over again. So, uh, yeah, usually I'll just do book one in a series, and then if I really like it, I'll do something like this, or I do a why you should read on the whole series overall or a series review. I'm not going to do individual non-spoiler reviews for a trilogy. It's just, it's just, it's not going to happen. I mean, I tried doing that Red Rising and how'd that go? Not too well, but uh, I definitely think that this is a series that will be read or better on a reread. I don't know when I would ever get to that, but yeah, I definitely would like to reread this knowing now what I didn't know before starting because the foreshadowing in this, totally epic. It is really, really well done and it's there from the beginning it really is and there's just so many things i would love to be reading now and being like ha i know what you're doing here that's excellent excellent you planted those seeds so early it was right in my nose and i did not see it so i hope guys that this clears up the confusion about lycanius and my feelings on it absolutely recommend it i definitely say you should read it. I just don't know that I'd recommend. Don't bust your TBR, what you have right now for it. But yeah, make it a point to read it because I think you have a good time, especially if you're a wheelie or a Lord Ruler Brandon Sanderson fan. And I think you'll enjoy yourself quite a bit. So guys, have you read Lycanius? What did you think? Drop in the comments and let me know and I will talk to you there.